visit this gentleman that had a luncheonette two doors down from Larissa's uh, um, hair salon. Larissa's, for those of you who know Manhattan, is lo was located between 120th and 121st Street on what was then 7th Avenue. It's now called Adam Clayton Power Group. And one um, Saturday, I, I came out and I saw a crowd at the end, which would have been 121st Street. Mind you, I'm, I'm talking to you as a child because these are my memories. And I remember uh, there was a crowd at the end, which would have been somewhere around 121st Street. I came back, I asked my mother if I could go, and she said, you know, be careful. And so I went down there and I worked my way, because at the time I was rather short, it remained short for a long time. I worked my way through the crowd, got to the front. And so the crowd is behind me here in, a, in like a semicircle. And I'm looking at this man, I mean, he's just had a circle by this door, but he's tall. And I'm looking up at him, and it just, it, it marvels me because I'm trying to figure out where his forehead ended and his hair began. <laughs> For those of you know who know Malcolm, his complexion and his the color of his hair was one and the same. He was a light complexion brother, but he also had an orange type of hair color. And he had it short, because this was pre Hodge time. He had it short. Didn't have any mustache. Clean shape. And I'm looking up at him and I'm trying to feel wow. This is my memory now. And you're going to see why this is important down the road. And you're going to see where this ties into you. Because as, as you saw that, you can get all the DVDs. I mean, you can see them. If you take the Malcolm X course with me, we'll go through a whole bunch of stuff. But what I, I need to share with you is something that I want you to take out of this room with you. And I would almost want this to be the type of experience for you that I had when I was seven. Okay, because I want to create a picture of this man because I'm looking up at him, I'm trying to figure out, I don't know who this is. All I know is this man is tall, and he's powerful, and I know that his skin complexion and his hair is the same. This is in the mind of a seven-year-old. And so, long story short, uh, whatever happened, he goes his way, the crowd breaks up, and I go back, and I sit down. Now, Mrs. Jefferson's stall, is the first stall in the beauty parlor. And so I used to sit, like where the flowers were in the front, and look out into Harlem at people passing by, the guy doing this, this. For those of you who used to play the numbers back then, you know what all this thing is. That's all. <laughs> Today you all played a lot. See, they stole that from us. We <laughs> call the numbers in Harlem. One of the finest organizations we had so. And you see how much billions are being made, right? If black folk had held on to that, we'd be rich. <laughs> they took it from us, made ours illegal, made theirs legal. They played a lotto. And if you play the numbers at home, they try to arrest you. Now, that's hypocrisy. But I'm sitting there, and a man that used to uh, work in the beauty parlor, because a lot of times when sisters have a place, brother's there, he does the odds and ends, he supports protects, make sure things are alright. He comes in, he flies in, he says, man, you won't believe who was just on the corner talking to us. And they say, well, who was it? He says, Malcolm X. Oh, man, get out of here with that. He wasn't there. Yeah, he wasn't there. You talking to us. He, he, I mean, he, just ask that young brother right there. You see that young? Ask him. He was looking up in Malcolm's face. I bet you he could tell you everything that Malcolm said. I don't remember. Because <laughs> my whole time looking up in his face was I was trying to figure out where his forehead ended and his hair <laughs> Now I tell you that, we laugh, but that's in the mind of a child. But as I was, as I was in the middle of those elders or that group talking to Malcolm, they said, preach, brother. Go ahead, man. Talk the truth. Tell the truth, brother. Preach, minister. The love that I felt as a seven-year-old child permeated and went through my body and went to him. I was right in the middle. And the love that he had for the people came through me back to them. Children can pick this up. They, I didn't know what he was talking about. Didn't even know who this was. But the one thing that I walked out of that with was the love that Malcolm had for the people. 
honest, sincere love. Unconditional love. And the love that the people had for him. I could feel it as a child. That's my memory of that. And the only way that I know that's Malcolm, that I can tell this story, is when that guy came in and said that about Malcolm X being on the corner. Because I would never have known to this day that I was in Malcolm's presence had that not happened. That's how you meet this. Now, you know, I'd like to lie to you. I'd like to tell you I saw him after that. I'd like to tell you that he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Your brother was up. <laughs> I like, but you know, I think that the fact that this story comes to you this way has more meaning. Because as brief as it was, I'm in front of you right now at the age where I am telling you this story. And that's the power of the story that I just told you. That this man could have such an impact on the community and on me. And on everything that represents me as an individual. And, and I'm working at it. I'm still trying uh, to be able to, by any means necessary, uh, continue this dialogue. Because I believe that a prophet is not a psychic. A prophet is just a good historian. Because when you know what happened in the past, you can understand what's happening in the present. And when you understand what's happened in the present, you can predict the future. So when you say that this is going to go down and this is going to go down and all of a sudden it go down, how did you know that? Well, I was just focused on the cosmos. No, it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the fact that you know history. And when a prophet says something, it's normally the last thing that they say to you that they're known for that is probably the reason why they were put on the planet. And the major thing that Malcolm said that got him into the situation that he got into was at the assassination of John F. Kennedy when he said chickens have come home to roost." because when he said that what's interesting is that Malcolm wasn't just speaking about the assassination of, Mal uh, of, of John F. Kennedy and the fact that of the violence that has been put on the world of color is now revisiting America by bringing down its chief executive he was talking about what's happening right now. He was talking about chickens have come home to roost right now. The generations that we're living in right now and what you're experiencing are the chickens that have come home to roost. The Occupy organization, that is the chickens have come home to roost. They didn't listen to what they were talking about back then, so you must relive history. You have to go through it again because we haven't made the changes necessary. This is the type of impact that Malcolm had on and when he discussed these issues with us, I would be brought up uh, a few months later, and I would be sitting at the feet of a teacher, and the teacher's name, they invited us up after he spoke, shook his hand. And it was Professor John Henry Clark. Professor John Henry Clark was Malcolm's teacher, Professor John Henry Clark also was one of the writers of that organization of African American unity that you heard Malcolm speak of. Well, John Henry Clark was also one of the writers of that charter. And I met Professor Clark when I was 12 and a half. Young brother. And they brought young bloods, young brothers, at least called them old heads, maybe six or seven years older than us. And they were conscious, they were conscious folk, they would bring us up, and we, uh, we were brought up to meet Professor Clark after he did a presentation in Harlem. And we were all introduced to him, we all shook his hand, and I was introduced to him. And at the time, before I corrected my name, it was Booker T. Coleman, Jr. And I was introduced, Booker T. Coleman. He said, oh, Booker T., you're going to be a great teacher one day. I was 12 and a half when he told me this. Oh, by the way, I wanted to be a priest when he told me this, too. So that shows you how far away or how far I've come from that point of view. But um, Professor John Henry Clark would uh, talk to me about certain situations, and this same group that brought me up to meet Professor John Henry Clark, a couple, maybe a year later, maybe two years later, would also bring me up to a Black Panther meeting. And from the moment I heard those brothers and sisters speak, I 
knew I wanted to be a part of what they were doing. So I joined the Black Panther Party. I was a cub. I was young. But the one thing I know and the one thing that I remember is when, when Bobby Seale came to us during our Black Solidarity Day a couple of years back, I think it was 2009, and he told us of the origins of the Black Panther Party. And I know that a lot of us get into the exoticness of the guns and we get into the exoticness of the fighting with the police. But that came after. The origin of the Black Panther Party came from Bobby Seale standing on a corner listening to this elder brother talking about black history, all the things that black folk did not know about themselves. Bobby Seale was an electrical engineer at the time. And he's listening to this story about, and he's saying, man, I don't know nothing about this. Nobody ever taught me this history before. Nobody, ever, I didn't know that black folk did this. And so Bobby Seale reaches out to a younger brother that's a law student. His name is Huey P. Newton. And he says, man, we need to get these classes somewhere in Oakland, man. We need to get these, the, these studies of black history in to college. And so they fight for it, and they get two courses in black studies. The Black Panther Party was formed not by fighting the police, but by wanting to know the history of oneself. And that's what Malcolm X is doing up here. What Malcolm did was he taught us history, African history. John Henry Clark used to tell us that the missing pages of world history is black history, is African history. And the reason why we don't understand what happened in the world is because we don't understand African history. And so from this movement, from this Malcolm's impact on these uh, young people, ready and willing to go out in the street and teach their history, is going to become birth of the Black Panther Party. And out of the Black Panther Party is going to give birth to the Black Studies Department, of which you are now sitting in the middle of. And this is why you have to support the Black Studies program here in Newport. If you want to know what you can do, you need to continue to take the courses of Black Studies. If I had my way, you'd double major. And one of them would be a major in Black Studies. If not major, at least minor. If not minor, just study black studies. Because your numbers in those classes determines if that department is going to hang around long enough. How many adjuncts you have determines on how you... So if you want to do something right now to make a change, continue taking black studies. That's one thing you can do right now because that's what Malcolm was about. Malcolm said that the greatest discipline that would best serve black folk, African folk, would be history. And this is what we've attempted to do in black studies. This is what we've attempted to do in talking to you, our young people, as it relates to who you are. And I do know that there are people, well, first of all, we're all African in this world. It don't make a difference between German, Japanese, Irish, and Africa. <coughs> All humans come from Africa. <coughs> and even Nigerians and Ghanaians are not originally from Nigeria and Ghana. They can trace their roots back to the Great Rift uh, Valley or the Great Lakes region also. And then as a human family started traveling across the planet, away from the sun, things happened, we look the way we live today. So if you want to know your history, you got to study African history. <coughs> and if you don't study African history, you only know your cultural history. But you don't know your racial history, because there's only one race on the planet. That's the human race. And that human race was born, nurtured, sustained, and taught all of the disciplines in Africa. And after Africans got their show together, then they took it on the road. This is what Malcolm taught us. And Malcolm said there's a difference between being violent and defending yourself. The Black Panthers taught us. And I'll never forget the day they walked into that legislature with those rifles. Because I just didn't think that black folk had that much courage. Their brothers and sisters walked into that legislature with their guns. But it's not them walking into the legislature with those guns that impacted me. It's that it was legal. And I never knew that. 
I never understood the right to bear arms. And I know that we'd all like to live in peace. I would too. But the question becomes, whose peace? And at what expense? And this is what Malcolm taught us. You have a right to defend yourself. If somebody busts your door down in the Bronx and they chase you into your house with no suspicion as to what you did or did not do and they chase you into your bathroom and they shoot you in your bathroom and they kill you and you're 18 years old and your name happens to be Romari happened just a couple of weeks ago in the Bronx. The police have no right to do that. But what you can do about it? What is anybody going to do? That becomes the question. And that's what Malcolm was taught. That's what the Black Panthers were taught. You don't have a right to come into my house and kill me with no reason. They still don't have a reason why they did that to that young man, 18 years of age. They said, well, he was transferring a gun, but he didn't know that the minister was taping what it was that the young man actually was doing. It was on tape. They said, well, we didn't bust the house down. But well, what she didn't know was that the woman that owned the house had a camera on the front door and, and observed the police kick the door in. Technology is something else, you know. You can't get away with what you used to get away with. We didn't have any problem with the police. We had problems with what we call the people. And the pigs were bad police. Not the good police. Because we need good police. We need people who will protect us and defend us. And I know many that are like that. That will protect and defend you in your community. But I also know the bad ones. And I've had impact on the bad ones. And Malcolm was the one that was saying, no one has a right to do that to you. And you have a right by any means necessary, not to let that happen. Violence? No, not violence. Self-defense. He told you himself. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the UN Charter, all are documents that if lived by and believed in are good documents. And they're important. The Constitution of the United States is quite a document, although it's a plagiarized version of the Native American uh, document known as Gaia Nenegawa, which is the great law of peace. People would just tell the truth about the Constitution of the United States and understand where that came from. Then we might understand why the Native Americans said this would never work. And that these couple of bills that you have that say that are your Bill of Rights will never work for as long as you don't do two things. And one of them was the respect for your woman. And even now, we have these congressional hearings deciding the fate of women by a group of men. Something wrong with that, ladies. Something real wrong with that. Somebody needs to say we're not going to have that. By any means necessary. And the second thing was, is how do you ever think you're going to talk about a Bill of Rights and you have African people enslaved? That's, that's hypocrisy. It'll never work. And for as long as you have that written and you act the way you act, you will always have to make corrections on your documents. And that's why we have all the uh, amendments. Because every amendment is a statement that says there's a mistake in the Bill of Rights where they have to amend the Bill of Rights. So I say just chalk the whole thing away. Let's just rewrite the whole Constitution. Hey, you can rewrite the Bible a couple of times. If you can rewrite the Word of God, <laughs> you certainly can rewrite the Word of a couple of white men didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying you believe. Don't believe me. Don't believe what I say. Just follow my train of thought. I don't want you to believe me. I just want you to think. And that's what Malcolm asked us to do. He asked us to think. Get out. 
get outside the box, but observe the box, but also understand all the things that are outside the box. Because as long as you're in the box, your solutions can only come from the box. And the box has been rigged to keep you in it. And that's what Malcolm taught us. And as part of the things that we uh, in Black Studies are attempting to do, would like to do, would be to begin to share some information with you to help you understand what Malcolm represented. And we can round it off this way. Because, although I've been given to 9 o'clock, I really want you to spend time talking. Because younger brothers and sisters, you're going to start talking. You see this pontification and this lecture stuff? I know y'all got used to lecture, but you know, Edu Carre is the bring out. And I think that the educational system, particularly when you're in college, is to start something. I like to tell people, I tell my class, I like to start. Okay, when it's too quiet and everybody's thinking everything is all right, I like to start stuff. But for those of you who've been in my class, you know I start some stuff. <laughs> I almost started something today in Malcolm class, but I knew I had to get here, so I said, I said I'm going to leave it alone. Talk about my brother, Jeremy Glenn, but I'll leave that alone. Four years later, I'm sitting in my house, getting ready to um, write a report for my social studies class. I'm speaking about four years after my first meeting with Malcolm. I was in the second grade then. I'm in the sixth grade now. And I am writing the report. The news is on. The six o'clock news is on. And something comes over the news that says that the preacher of hate has been killed by hate. Then they flash Malcolm. Now by now I know about Malcolm. I've heard about Malcolm. I knew that I was in his presence. But the first thing that happened to me, this is what children and child's minds do. The first thing that I automatically did was I went right back to that day that I was in front of him. And I literally could feel the love and the respect that was given to him by the people and he to the people. And so when they said the preacher of hate, I knew they weren't telling the truth because I felt nothing but love in this brother's presence. I realized that um, something was wrong. And I didn't feel good. And I decided that with all great people who, for whatever reason, joined the ancestors, they're, they're, they're no longer there, but what can you do? And I, I, I've always tried to be positive. And so what I decided to do was, I decided to give birth to Malcolm within me. The spirit of Malcolm. I wanted to carry Malcolm's spirit. Think about what I was going to do. Down the road, the Black Panther Party would come into existence. Down the road, I would get my education. Down the road, I would learn history and culture. But I remember there was... Um, a part in the book, the most important part, a part of the book to me, they revised the book so the page may be different, but it's page 300 in the old book. Could be 301, 304, something like that with your book. Malcolm is talking about, he's uh, talking to this man. And he said they didn't agree on much, but the one thing that they did walk away with agreeing is that by the year 2000, that children, school children, would know the true color of the great people of antiquity. And so I took that part in, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to study the history of the people of antiquity, of which I did. In 2002, my older daughter, Sasha, came to New York. She invited me up to speak to a group. It would be this day, in 2004. Now you, now you got to see how all this coalesces. February 21st, 1965 was a Sunday. Okay, the reason why I know when I came was because it was winter break in the public school system. As a teacher, I was off. So I came up on Tuesday. They asked me to do something on the Black Panther Party. 
And the relationship that I had with the students was just electric. I mean, it was just powerful. If you should reach back to the particular um, newspaper, uh, Oracle News, uh, they wrote up an article about my visit and, you know, you know, Black Panther comes and dispels the myths. And I had such a relationship. I was invited back to come in May. Came back in May. They said, you know, we really would like you to come and teach a class. Now, I want to go back. Remember on page 300 where he talks about people of antiquity, right? I decided I wanted to do that. And so I decided that I was going to do that. And the Black Panther Party, I came up and talked to the young people uh, in um, Du Bois. It was in Du Bois that I came and spoke to them. And came back in May. And wow, the relationship was just so powerful. I mean, it was just really one, one of the greater experiences that I've had as it relates Something like what I'm feeling right now, okay, because this is great to me. And I received a call from Dr. Wade Lewis in about June of 2004, and she said, you know, the students have put in a request through your daughter, Sasha, possibly for you to come in and teach a class. She said, are you interested? I said, sure, I'm interested. She said, uh, well, how about if we teach a class on introduction to Africa? I said, yeah. She said, how about a class on antiquity? Remember Malcolm now? The true color of the people of antiquity. I said, yeah, I'll come up. I'm going to teach Introduction to Africa. So I was interviewed. Dr. Zelbert Moore, Dr. Williams Myers, and Dr. Wade Lewis conducted the interview. Hired me, brought me up. I taught the class. 